Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the 22 Grand Pod podcast. In this episode, we're talking to Gary Jarman of The Cribs. The Cribs are a band who have cropped up time and time again on the podcast, and not only did they have a huge influence on the scene back in the day, they've also gone on to be one of the biggest success stories of that era, as they continue to produce critically acclaimed albums nearly 20 years on. Gary was able to join Tom and I during lockdown from his home in Portland, and we were pleased to hear that he was already familiar with the podcast. I've been enjoying listening to the podcast, you know. Like, I listen to, uh, I listen to all of them so far. It's been, it's been fun. Oh, no. man. Just, just hearing some of it. I don't know. It's funny, like when there's, there's certain people that you haven't seen for a long time, and you yeah. hear them years later talking about, they're talking within the same context as what you remember them like in the past. It's just kind of, it, uh, especially in this lockdown situation when you feel pretty. Uh, disconnected from people in general it's like it's kind of surreal you know so yeah yeah, yeah it's, I know what you mean. It's, just, it's just like a nice nice way to look back on it as well isn't it the, the nostalgia starting you know yeah i, I always you always the... think i remember when i was a kid when i remember well i remember like a few years ago in the 90s nostalgia started coming back and i was like i was told about it it's like man that, that's never gonna happen i was like that's, one that's too recent and and two it's like it didn't have a defined enough style because like when you when you grow up with that you don't, yeah. you don't recognize that it is a style. So I'm like, and then when it first started coming back, I remember because that, uh, that band Yuck were opening for us in Brighton at the uh, Khan Exchange or whatever it was called. And um, yeah. and I was being told like, oh, there's this 90s band and a 90s band. And I was like, I, I find that really, I can't imagine what that even is, you know? And then, and then of yeah. course, like, I was like, oh yeah, like I see that. Yeah, and then straight, was, straight away it was like, oh yeah, it's got a little bit of like, I don't know. Yeah, and then that whole wave began, and it, and mm. it, but it always felt like too recent to me. And I, and I remember like thinking it can't possibly happen in our era. But I think I almost feel like this lockdown sort of like um, meant that people have just started thinking back to like happier days or something, and it's somehow, <laughs> yeah, like, it's accel- so true, yeah. it somehow accelerated that that whole wave of nostalgia or something. And it's weird. It's, it it trips me out because like. I've been doing the same thing ever since then, you know. So I don't, yeah. I don't, I, I, I don't even, I don't even notice it really. I yeah, don't. yeah, of course. It, I, I think people are just like maybe taking stuff for granted a bit as well now, obviously. So. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, I miss that. Oh, remember when I did that? Shit, I can't even do that. Well, it's, now, you know? I remember like just, just like little thing. Yeah, like certainly um, those days were were very community based like and uh, because the people were kind of this this is this is almost like a socio political like way of looking at it but like the world it, it, it was a unique period of time that um that can't ever really be revisited uh, reason being is because it was the it was it was the advent of people connecting to each other over the internet. So, like, what you had was like people who'd previously lived analog lives, like like we had, like like through fanzines and mixtapes and all the all the sort of conventional ways that people would connect with each other back in in the pre-internet mm-hmm. era. And yeah. for the first for the first time, the uh, the technology was there for people to be able to connect directly and with people who felt the same in uh in different towns but but it was before people took that for granted it was before people it's before that became the norm so it's like people were just really infatuated and, and couldn't believe that they could connect with other like-minded people that easily so it, it's that kind of perfect storm of like the technology was there to support this like massive explosion of 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 community and connectivity but without people taking it for granted it was an exciting thing as opposed to being a, a normal thing you know and that's that's yeah. what really drove that whole thing that's what really drove that whole explosion and that whole scene in a lot of ways yeah, it's, it's so true that isn't it because it, it it was a lot different to like any i, I imagine anywhere to like the brick pop area where you weren't as close to 
your bands, you know? Yeah, well, I, I mean, obviously in those days, like, and 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 that was a, you know, a a, a real mainstream phenomenon, like, which, you know, mm. to, to a degree, you know, the two thousands, like that, that was the same thing. Like everything went mainstream and 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 sort of and and sort of dominated uh, radio and, and and media for a while. Which so it was it was similar to it in that way. But like I think in the nineties, because of the 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 different ways that people you know, from, from a media perspective and from a, uh, a, you know, from the way that bands promoted themselves, it was like they, they, those, they always seem more untouchable, whereas like mm. the 2000s, like they started becoming accessible and like, you mm. know, obviously the, the, the biggest, the biggest example and the biggest success of the 2000s being the Arctic Monkeys, like that was, it's not that they made themselves accessible, but I remember it's funny, like, I remember, like, people, uh, the press being like, this band came out of nowhere and, like, it became the biggest selling record of the year and, like, and they couldn't, they couldn't believe it. But to, to kids like us, and I'm sure to you, like, yeah. everyone was fully aware of, of that and yeah. fully aware that that was going to happen because, like I was saying, it's like kids were just, like, connected up for the first time and, like, and you could yeah. see the fact that they, they loved the fact, they loved that nobody knew about their, their world. They, they, they really cherished it. And so, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, it, when it exploded, it was funny because the, to the press, it came out of nowhere, but that's because they were probably an older generation, whereas, like, to, to the people who were, who were out there living it, it was just like, it, I don't... It didn't feel unexpected at all. It felt like, um, you know, you, you, it was palpable to, to, to people mm. like us. I'm sure it's a question you've been asked quite a few times, Gary, but uh, can you just give us an idea of how you went from starting the Cribs to getting a record deal? Yeah, man, it was like the, it was the craziest time, you know, because, like, it was... <laughs> 2001 probably um although me and me and my brothers had been playing together you know ever since we were kids because I, I was, that, I was what, gonna, sorry i was gonna actually ask that i was gonna ask about um because the other only last week i um i discovered a is it wrinkle yeah yeah my, my, i discovered uh, a wrinkle song band, yeah yeah i was gonna ask you about that before you go into the, the crib yeah stage. well so wrinkle formed in 1994, uh, between me and Rai and a couple of uh, uh, friends at high school. And then, you know, it's your first band, like you see classic sort of um, you wear your influences on your sleeve and just kind of, uh, you know, it's just for fun, really. But we, we, we carried it on for a while. And when we got to college, um, me and Rai, like, uh, we, like, we sort of drifted apart a little bit from the friends that we, we we had at school and we got a new drummer who's really great and um carried it on for a little while but it was like to be honest it, it was a, it was a different it was a different world like wakefield was like um very different at that point um you know more punk oriented wrinkle was sort of a bit more kind of like poppy uh I don't know. We we sort of wanted to be weird, but like we were sort of a bit more straightforward. But um, yeah. but yeah, carried it on going. Carried it, carried it going for a while. I mean, it's funny. I'm looking, but I look back on some of that stuff now, and like you know, some of it sounds pretty good to me. Like other other bits, like you know, you can sort of like you can just hear your influences really. Which right. you know, we were really into Dinosaur Junior. And... Yeah, do you know what I was literally about to say when I listened can... to this one that I uh, listened to on YouTube last week. It was just—it was very dinosaur junior. Like. Yeah, that's what we were I, I like into. It, I like it a lot. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Yeah, it's—I like, mean, and it's just like it's funny because um, you know, like I was saying, I'd always been playing with my brothers, like me and Rai. Like you know, we 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 played together forever, and, we, and there's n there's n no one else I would ever rather play with. It's like he's like yeah. an amazing guitar player, and like and, and 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 we know each other so well. So like, and then. So we've, you know, uh, we've always played together, and then we had, we had to wait till Ross got a little older, really, in some ways. But like we used to force Ross into playing drums <laughs> with us, like you know, no matter what. Like he had electronic yeah. pads at home, and then like we made him a, a drum kit out of a snare drum because like the, the snare drum was a, 
uh, the snare drum was a kick drum. That's how small he was. So we were sort of forcing him into <laughs> doing stuff. But then by the time he got to like 16, I think, we, we used to make demos at home, like little, little, just again, like just covers and everything. But we were sort of conditioning him towards being our drummer. And then initially when the Cribs started, or like when we started like recording as the Cribs, it was summer 2001. Um, we did these three demos, really kind of, uh, I, really sort of grungy, to be honest. And um, they, we put them out on an NME CD a few years ago. No one had heard them before, but that was just me and Rai. Um, mm. Really grungy. And the idea was like, oh, we'll just send it, we'll just send it to Kill Rock Stars and be like, which is a label out of uh, Olympia, Washington, who, like, you know, we just wanted to sign to them. That's all we really wanted to do. And we were like, we'll just send it to them and, like, you know, be like, hey, we're, you know, we're two brothers from a small town in the industrial north of England. And mm -hmm. we thought they'd dig the backstory and we thought they'd dig the, the music. But we made the demo and it never got around to sending it. But again, that's a, sort of indicative of how different the world was because I would have had to, like, found an address and then, like, you know, posted it from the post office to, like, the other side of the world. And it's, like, you know, think... And, and like, a story about a band being from, like, you know, 5,000 miles away in, in the industrial working-class town of Wakefield, that would seem weird, whereas now the world's more connected. So it, 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 it's, you know, the, the circumstances would be, would be pretty different. So, but that's, that's, that's what we were doing in 2001. And then, you know, Ross was at a point where he was, uh, you know, old enough to sort of, sort of play with us. And, um, and he, he was great because he was super malleable. He had, he had no preconceptions at all. Like we were like, we want, we want you to chew gum because Elvis's drummer chews gum and it looks cool. <laughs> or we want you to like, you know, n no fills, no fills allowed or, you know, like little yeah. things like that. And, and, and he yeah. was really malleable because he was just like, he'd never been in a band before. And me and I were pretty experienced at that point. And we just wanted Ringo. We just wanted a guy who could play like Ringo. That's all we wanted. Or Karen Carpenter or something like that. You know, we didn't want a, we didn't want a rock drummer or an impressive kind of uh, fancy drummer. We wanted like just a pop, a pop kind of like um, backing, backing musician sort of thing. So yeah, like Ringo or Karen Carpenter is what we were after. And, and Ross was like really good at that because he was like, he was pretty inexperienced and he was also just, he had, he didn't have an ego towards it, you know? And yeah. um, so we, that was like late 2001. By that point, we started making demos, like really rough demos. And then um, at, the, at the very start of 2002, we moved into a, uh, a large space called Springtime Studios. You'll remember it, Tom, because uh, you guys yeah. came up there. Yeah, um, I remember that. I was I loved that place. We had a couple of parties in there. Oh, it was so awesome. It was a it was a yeah, massive it was just for just for background, it was a massive floor of a of a mill that was down. Go on, Tom. I was gonna say I'll never forget one time in there where um we, we, Sam was with us as well, Sam Riley. And mm. you and you were you were playing uh it was before you'd brought You're Gonna Lose Us out. And I'm sure he was singing it with you. Yeah, it's Did funny. You... I, I had no recollection of that. Somebody mentioned it. I had no recollection. But I, I, yeah, I remember I remember you guys playing it and Sam was singing you're you're gonna lose it. Yeah. yeah, well the more I remember it now, okay, so like we used to have these like parties at springtime. It was like that that was the name of the studio. We call it springtime. Um it used to belong to a, another Wakefield band called Pylon back in the nineties, but then uh, they'd been moved out for a while and we, we ended up moving in, but it was called springtime. But we used to have these like uh, all night, pretty much all night parties. Sometimes a bit extending to like a, a full weekend or whatever. And like people, again, it was in those early days of the internet. People would take the mega bus to come see shows. Like people would come from all around and we'd let them stay, stay then. I remember, yeah, you guys were there or maybe all the Paddingtons and, um, and Sam from 10,000 Things and all those 10,000 things, guys, they would hang out there sometimes. They shot a video there. And I don't remember, I don't necessarily remember the You're Gonna Lose This thing, but I spoke to Ross about it. And yeah, we were throwing the song around for a while. And I think what it was, was we didn't have any ideas for the verse. We had the chorus. We didn't have any ideas for the verse. So we probably just were talking about collaborating with Sam and like have him sing it. Um, mm. But 
I don't have any explicit memories of it. If, if it, we probably recorded it actually, because I was going to, I was we, just going to ask if is, is there a recording of that? I wonder. We probably did because we used to, we used to like do rough recordings of all of our band practices on mini disc, or like you know, like any time you get like a new idea, we'd, we'd do a rough recording on mini disc. Um, and we've just been archiving a lot of stuff recently, and like um, I'm going to digitize all in mini discs at some point. So I'll have a look and see if it's on there. But um, I mean, it, it's more than likely, more than likely is, you know. But um, yeah, but yeah, yeah that'd the, be good to hear that. The studio was great, though. Like it was a just an entire floor of a mill. So we had loads of room. It had a we had a stage in there for live gigs in the main room, which was pretty big. And then we had a practice room at the back. And then a studio at the front, and um, we used to I used to rent it out to other bands during the week. So that was kind of like kind of my day job. I would finish. I used to work in the toilet roll factory with my brothers, and then we would finish work, and I would go down there and let bands in, and that's what would pay the bills. And then on a night, um, the cribs would take over because like you know bands didn't want to rehearse at night. So we used to just pretty much rehearse from like. 10 o'clock onwards, like pretty late. And then as soon as we'd finished the song in the practice room, we'd drag all the gear into the studio in the front room and record it. So it was really liberating and it was really fun. And yeah, um, that's, amazing. that's when that's when we wrote the, all of the first demo. And um, we, pre we got signed off that. I mean, going back to your original question, we got signed off that. We sent the demo to... Um, a venue in Sheffield called the Lead Mill. Uh, we wanted a gig there. Um, and Ryan, he, we didn't send it actually. Ryan took it on the train and uh, he just waited for the, it's kind of like Airheads, that movie Airheads. He waited for the, <laughs> for, the, for the postman to go through the door and he just followed the postman in, you know, like into the <laughs> building. And then just went up to the office and was like, oh, you know, we've got this band, uh, the Cribs, we want a, we want a gig and, and handed it to the promoter at the Lead Mill. Um, and at the time, and this is probably part of the reason why as well, like at the time, the promoter of the Lead Mill was managing a band called Hogboy, who were a Sheffield band, who were like getting a lot of hype. And um, that, get, that guy called us the next day and was just like, oh, I really like your demo. Um, I'd like to work with you, but Hogboy's taking up all my time. And um, so... But then he was talking about the gig or whatever, I can't remember. But um, but then within like the week, we got a phone call. We, me and Ryan were doing uh, exams at college and we got a phone call just saying, uh, it was from a guy at Virgin, which was which was like obviously not what we expected, but Virgin called my my mobile number, which I don't know where they got it from. And um, want, they wanted, they were interested in seeing us play live and interested in signing us, so... We um we we booked a show down in London and and it was it was it was crazy because like we booked the show for like the start of summer and like from the period of time that we got the phone call from Virgin to to, to actually doing the show was probably about six weeks but like during that during that period of time like it, it was just like a snowball rolling downhill you know like every since Virgin got in touch like. It, lots of people started getting in touch and i guess it's because it, everyone in the industry knows each other i know that now from having been in the industry a long time it's like everyone's mm. connected everyone knows each other everyone talks to each other and um the interest just got like really really intense really quick and we had only ever sent out one demo so it was like it was bizarre but they must have been copying it for each other i, I, I don't know how it happened it's like that time was so odd because like british British labels and British uh, the the British music industry just was desperate to to have to get on the on the bandwagon of the on that garage rock bandwagon like the Strokes and the White Stripes were so big and they come out of nowhere that they just really like a young band like us who had a really lo-fi demo because we were three brothers from up north and playing this sort of, you know, poppy, garagey, lo-fi music. It was like all of a sudden you were a hot commodity. And we went down to do a, that first London show at the Barfly. And um, it was, there was just a lot of industry there. It was, it, it was surreal. Because, you know, being from Wakefield in the 90s and into the early 2000s, you just didn't, 
you didn't ever expect that. You never got those opportunities. Like you had to be like a London pro band to like get interest or whatever. And we were just, we didn't know what we were doing. You know, like we, we went down there and just like, we didn't have a clue. It was, it was mm. crazy. So you were just playing, who, who was there then like at, the, at this? The who, first, who, did the you, first... who did you end up signing? Like, who, was, was it like a bit of a battle or what? Well, the first London show was like, um, I can't remember who was there, but like, I remember after the show, Chrysalis, um, who, who we still work with, they're our publishers, Chrysalis just offered us a deal there and then, you know, they were just like, mm. which was, which I, I couldn't believe it. It was like out of a movie, you know, you don't, you don't think that that's how it happens. You don't think that they just say, we want to sign you. Like, so we went down totally naive, played this show. I don't even remember if it was a good show. I mean, I think, I mean, we were pretty, we were pretty good live, but like we were definitely rough around the edges. And like, um, and after the show, I remember it was Chris Lace, there was um, a girl called Claire, who was our first sort of fan down there. And her boss was called Polly. And um, they came up to us straight after the show and was just like, we want to we want to see you downstairs in like five minutes. So we're like, oh, okay, um, a little bit intimidating. But so we went downstairs <laughs> and um, it was just crazy. Like we sat down and, and just said it straight away. She was like, uh, we want to offer you a deal. And I was like, we, we, we couldn't believe that that's the way that it works. We just thought that surely that it was less dramatic than that. We want to offer you a deal. And we were like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> trying to play it cool like, yeah okay and, <laughs> yeah, then, yeah, yeah. and, then, and then like and she I remember I remember she was like it's not going to be a big deal but it's enough to get you it's enough to get you um to be able to quit your job and go on tour for the next 18 months and um and we'll give you like money to buy gear and then she told us how much they were going to offer us and I'd never I mean I I I'd never heard of money like that before, you know? It was like, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, it's not like, it wasn't like life-changing money, but to somebody who works in a factory, it was like, holy yeah. shit, you know? And I, yeah. I would, honestly, like, I would have signed for nothing at that point. I was like, I just, I just wanted yeah, to yeah. do it, you know? And, yeah, and so that, that was, it was surreal. It, I mean, and it was really, it was really happy, you know? I was like, I couldn't, I'd never really had any goals other than um, sort of trying to make a, trying to just trying to have fun and try and be a good band and just, you know, try and get out of Wakefield. That was part of it at the time because, yeah, again, I'm going back to like people weren't connected up in those days and you you just wanted to, you just wanted escapism. My, my, my entire teenage years were based around just wanting to, you know, expand my horizons and, and sort of escape into the world. And um, so being offered a deal was, was insane and like being offered to go on tour. And we just, I would, I would have done it for nothing. And then I started talking money. Like and I, I was a little bit drunk and it was like, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was just insane. And that's, now that sounds like such an old school music industry tale. I just don't, it sounds so like, like something that would have happened in the sixties, mm-hmm. like that, that 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 side of the industry doesn't really exist anymore. You know, it was pretty old school back then. And did you feel there was like a community of bands or a scene going at that point, Gary? Or not really? No, not at that point. We didn't. Um, at that point, we were very much on our own because we were totally autonomous. We had our own studio. We had. Um, we were from Wakefield. We were pretty isolated. We were three brothers, so we were very insular. Um, as far as like a scene goes, like yeah, we, we felt connected to. The, 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 we initially started out as very much part of the indie pop kind of DIY scene. Um, in Leeds, promoters like Johnny Strangeways and Automated Alice, uh, they were putting on like really. They, they were very much of that we indie pop world and that was the first scene that that was the first group of people that we were embraced by they were big champions of ours like like um we got to play shows with some of our heroes like comic gain and k 
Calvin Johnson from Beat Happening, and um, oh, yeah, that, that was again. our. You did a cover of uh, was it what Saturday was Night song? Facts of Life? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. they were absolutely a, a my one of my biggest influences. Like I, I just loved that band, and like and we wanted that's the world that we wanted to be part of, really. Um, it's why we made that demo for Kill Rocks, that's because that's that's who put out Comic Games records, and we just wanted to be part of that world. Um, and we we kind of were like 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 I said, Leeds um, had this indie pop kind of like counterculture thing going on in in the Hyde Park area, and and we were very much part of that. And like they were our people, like the real losers, the Seven Inches, um, you know, the, those sort of local bands. Um, that 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 was that was what we were that's what we were interested in, um, and we never really expected that we would make the leap from that to this kind of zeitgeisty NME garage rock scene. Although, like you know, we'd, we'd obviously we'd heard the Strokes record "Is This It" that 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 was out that year. That was kind of everywhere, and like Rye was really excited about that. He well he he had that he had that first EP, and he was just like. He bought it because he needed to get some bus fare and they wouldn't take a fiver, so he had to go buy a record in HMB to get some change, which sounds like <laughs> such an old-timey story. <laughs> I but, love um, that. That was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so he bought that first EP, and I remember he called me, and he was like, man, it, like, it's, it's so, it sounds so weird. He's like, it, 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 sonically, it's, it sounds great. And, like, I remember, like, we were going to college on the bus one day, and he was like, you know... It's weird that lo-fi, that lo-fi is kind of getting big. I just can't, I can't believe that you can hear records that sound like this on the radio. And then, yeah, I mean, our demo, the our first demo was more for like that, you know, for getting gigs like in in Leeds and 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 Sheffield and stuff on the on that kind of yeah that indie pop sort of world. And um, but it got picked up in London, and I think you know, obviously, it's it's three brothers playing garage rock music like we we were being pursued by labels because that was the zeitgeisty thing at the time and you know I'd, I'd heard about stuff like that happening i'd heard like oh in the in the punk years like bands would start and just get signed really quickly because of, it was a, it, that that was what people were into at the time and it was easy to do i never really believed it but that's that's definitely what we experienced you know and like we were very we were very guarded about it, but it was hard to not be excited. I mean, we we yeah, we walked straight into that Chrysalis deal and and um it was mainly the major labels at first who were who were interested, which which doesn't doesn't sort of fit the conventional wisdom, but like but they're the people who are kind of most they've got the most money and they've and they've got the most kind of like they just want to snap everything up, you know. So we we were getting pursued by bigger labels and we were, we really held them at arm's length. Um, and I remember that we went back down to London to do another showcase, like another showcase kind of gig, like, like for labels. And we, we had a few indie labels come in this time and Rye was really into the, really into the Moldy Peaches that summer that that first Molly Peaches album would come out and that was great and like super mm. lo-fi and it sort of bridged the gap a little bit between that garage rock scene and the you know and the sort of like lo-fi kind of scene that we were into it was sort of it was sort mm. of like in between them things and and Rai found um James Endicott from Rough Trade's number on the sleeve of that or like not his number but he found his name like in the sleeve and so Rai called Rough Trade and he's like hey can I speak to James Endicott and and they're like, who is it? And he's like, just tell him, just tell him that it's the Cribs. And obviously, he didn't know we were, but he took our call anyway. He's a cool dude, and he, he took our call. And Rice's like, oh, we we've got a load. We call the Cribs. We've got a load of interest. Uh, we've got a lot of labels coming down, but we don't really like any of them. And um, you know, I thought we you guys seem cooler. So do you want to come down and? check us out and, he, and sure enough like all of a sudden he's like yeah put me book me in i'll be there and it, it really was that easy i mean it was like yeah. it was just a crazy time it was a crazy time for for bands like it, you just sort of like uh, 
all bets were off, you know, and and it, it probably it probably will annoy some people to hear me talk this sort of blase about it, but there was no. I mean, I, I paid my dues in the nineties. There was no struggle with this band at all. It was like we just walked straight into it at the at these showcases. So, like when you play into these levels, what uh, did you have your the songs off the first record? Was that it was what you the first were demo then? mainly? Yeah, we had some of them off the first record. Mm. Um, like uh, another number was the the song that essentially got assigned, which is. Yeah. Um, We'd, we'd done, we'd recorded that for the demo. It's supposed to be track two on the demo, actually, because we used to open with a song called On the Floor. That was our set opener. Um, yeah. And, and so that was going to be first on the demo, and, and maybe another number was going to be like later on. But just as a quirk of fate, like when we, when we mixed another number, there's like a weird sort of like little, the demo version of a number, uh, another number, there's like a weird little sound at the start, uh, like a, like that was, because we used these really old tapes and it was something that was on the tape before. And we just thought that was a cool way to open the demo. So we, we put it on first. And honestly, had we not put it on first, I don't think we would have, that demo would have el elicited as much interest as w what it did because Chris mm -hmm. pretty much told us, like, we heard, we heard another number and it was like, it was hooky and everyone in the office loved it. And that's why we wanted to sign it. So that was a little quirk of fate. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I always tell bands now i'm like you know if you're ever going to make a demo you, you, just, you people do only listen to the first 30 seconds you've got to you just got your best song on first that's it you know yeah definitely Th those early days were were just so vibrant and uh like i was like a, i was saying but like we put our first record out uh, we recorded the first record in 2003. It took a little while. So, like, the first demo was 2002. Uh, we were signed by the summer of 2002. And then um, we didn't sign with Wichita. It was our first label. We didn't sign with them until, like, um, two th early 2003 or sometime in 2003. And then we, start, we recorded the album over the summer of 2003. And then... Um, we were a bit frustrated. We we wanted it out earlier because, like, you know, the, our first record should probably come out in 2002, truth be told. But um, but we wanted to get it right. And we signed with Wichita and then it, we, we recorded it at Torag over the summer. And consequently, it didn't come out until the start of 2004. And by that point, it... it it did okay. It, it 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 didn't it didn't like set the world on fire or anything. It did okay, but like it, it was like it was, yeah. I mean, for for what we wanted, uh, we we were still trying to adhere more to the indie pop world. We didn't really want to. We didn't really want to move into that um, sort of, you know. We didn't really want to move into that zeitgeisty thing. Like we were just trying to hold it off and. Um, but that first record, say it was, it was, did okay. But it was kind of more of a cult thing. Like people who knew it liked it, but like it didn't, it didn't have broad based. You know, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like, it didn't, it wasn't like anything that came later. So we were maybe a little bit disillusioned, and um, but then Wichita wanted us to start making our second record. They, they wanted us to make our second record straight away. They didn't. They, they didn't want us to have a gap to like, you've got your first record out. We need your second record out straight away. And, and I understand that now because it was such a prime time that it was like, it made sense to like strike while the iron was hot. Um, and while, so we, but we didn't, we, we were just, we really just wanted to keep playing shows. Like we, cause if we weren't playing shows, we were just back at home, back at my mom's house really. And, um, because we were away so often, we didn't we didn't have our own places anymore. So we, we just tried to stay active. And now that was when I first discovered what I was saying before about like the the community that was going on online. I, I never knew about it before because I was you know pretty insular, like I was saying. And but we had a our, our website, which we'd never had a website before. But we had a website and it had a, a message board and like obviously like. We we just noticed that like there was lots of kids on there and like and from all over the world and they all kept in 
contact with each other. And it made us feel, we couldn't believe it because like the, the album hadn't been that, that, that big, but there were so many people online and, and that, that were connected up. And like, we'd never seen anything like that before. And then, so we were, we, we didn't, we would just wanted to be doing shows, which is how weren't going to give us any more tour support. They wanted us to write a record, but we wanted to be doing more shows. And so, yeah, we, we just were like, we just put it out on our forum. We just like, we'll play anywhere, you know, we, we'll, we'll play anywhere as long as you cover our costs. That was pretty much our, our, um, credo towards things. And, um, we, we were kids from a small town. We knew that small towns had their own thing going on and that most bands overlooked the provincial towns. And we, we wanted to, we wanted to get out there into the, into the pr- provinces and, and play for people. And that's pretty much what we ended up doing. But, um, and I think that's probably how we met you, Tom. I mean, we always had a good, we always had a really, really good relationship with Hull. I think there's something Hull and Wakefield has in common and like, we bonded yeah, with, prob- with Hull really similar. quickly. Yeah, quite similar. Yeah. People yeah, no, similar. it's true. Like we, we got on straight away and, um, mm. and we, we, so we always felt pretty, uh, we, um, in the, uh, like, so when we first started doing these, these sort of shows that we were booking ourselves, we, we played Hull a few times. We met the Paddingtons in Hull. Um, they played us a couple of times and, you know, we thought they were great i mean these are like young guys like you seem so young actually like and but really um just, yeah when we met you, you know, were probably probably 17 or 18 yeah teenagers like but but just really really believed really really committed you know like I, it that was that was in, that was just like a it was inspiring that like that we, we could go to different cities and see oh yeah the this is this is what's happening in the city. This is the this is the best band in this place. Like this is the this is what's going. It's it just nice for us to be able to to go to these places and, and get down it, get down to like what was really going on, as opposed to like you know if you go if you're going on like a regular tour that's booked by your agent or your promoter, you just see that like that kind of that that side of things. Whereas when you were booking it yourself, you were seeing the sort of the kids there, you were, you were getting, you were making contacts and meeting people and, and seeing the real side of it. And, um, and it, I think it was through the, I think it was probably through you guys that we ended up with, like, but you guys were playing a lot in London at the time and like, and were very popular, like on, on that circuit. And like, mm-hmm. and we found out that, I think it was, we found out through you that, you know, down in London, that that first album was pretty popular with a lot of those, with a lot of that scene, you know. And um, we had no idea, so like we started booking these sort of like gigs down there, booking booking ourselves, or maybe you would be booking gigs, and we'd be playing with you, and we were just, we, it was it was awesome for us because like, oh man, everyone down here knows that first record, and we had no idea because to us we just thought it was like we had no idea that people people knew it like that you know and that was that was cool we went we went down to london and felt i don't know it kind of felt like a big deal i suppose which we yeah. weren't used to so it was it was wicked it was like it, and and to us it was an extension of that diy world that we came from because we were booking the shows ourselves or like the kids down there who were bookers they were like you know they were self promote they, they they would just promote gigs it, it, it all felt very organic and like an extension to us of what what was going on in the diy scene except it was the diy scene was people who were a little bit older and you know definitely more old school in their sort of uh analog uh you know uh, sort of like fanzines and tapes, like I was saying before, like whereas like this was like teenage kids who were like doing everything on the internet, and that was like that was that was very new to us. So, um, to us, it was like an extension of that, and and it is it's hard to sort of contextualize for people who weren't there. But that to me, that was like the first. Uh, I don't know. It was just the first. I it, the first time I realized like how powerful the internet was or, or, or could be just because like you know you would do those shows be it in london or wakefield or wherever and you you really would have people come 
on the mega bus from like all all parts of the country. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, it was like, um, and I, I, that that'll never happen again because it'll never be new to people again. It was so new at that point that like everybody was just excited by that. You know, excited by that ability to connect with people. It was really pure. Mm. You know, obviously it ended up. You, you all know this as well, but you know, there, it it reached saturation point pretty quickly, and like there was a lot of there was a lot of blaggers and a lot of like scenesters and and that that started connecting themselves to. But in those early days, it, it there was a there was a purity about it that was really it was really fun, you know. Like you yeah. meet people and you just like minded you, people. You, you, you felt like you could trust like yeah, quite a lot of people really as well, like. Even with, like, you know, you just become friends with like all all the fans and stuff, and it, it was just like, just a really yeah, good and, feel, and, it? and there would and and it would carry forward like really well. I mean, so um, when we put our second record out, it was weird because we'd made that second album like pretty much while we were on the road. You know, like we we didn't we didn't really have much time off, and we made that second record, and um, we didn't we didn't really have super high expectations for it, but then we started releasing the singles from, from those records and there were, the singles were going into the, into the top 40. Like, I mean, all the singles from that record went into the top 40 and some of them went yeah, pretty high. I remember that, that album was like, it just felt massive to me that like when you were bringing like hair scenes throughout and stuff, it was just like, just you know, hair kind of, scenes was, it, felt, was it felt like you'd just gone like a, a quite a big step. Yeah, I, I, it did. It did for us for sure. Like it was, it was entirely different from the experience of the first record. And like, and all of a sudden, the, you know, the floodgates were open a little bit because you were ex- like, we weren't expected to just be part of our own little world. It was like all of a sudden, it was, it was national and even international. You know, like you, you, you'd hear you song on on the on Radio One, for example, and like we didn't we didn't necessarily have like huge support from radio because we're still a little bit under the radar at that point but i remember like crazy stuff like you know bands would get signed to to by by 2005 which is when the second record came out there was a lot of bands would get signed to major labels get loads of money thrown at them and um not perform as well as bands like us or you guys who just had the the kids behind them you know like we we would put i remember we put hey scenes out and we got a phone, we were on tour in Europe at the time. We'd gone out to Europe and, and we got a phone call from our manager saying, Oh, hey, since this is it is at number eleven in the in the midweek charts, which was insane. Like com- I mean, completely out of out yeah. of anything we could have ever expected. So he was like, So look, you're probably gonna get an offer for top of the pops this week. Um, so we you know, we might need you to come home. So they started booking uh, flights to get us back for Top of the Pops. Yeah. Um, which we, again, we were totally shell shocked. We said, like, whoa, that's just insane. And then, um, but then the, and this shows how naive everything was. He was like, but the thing is, like, we don't know if it's going to go top 10 yet because, um, or if it's going to go top 20 yet because um, the downloads are going to be eligible for the chat for the first time this week. Oh, we And then they're like, we don't think it'll make much difference, but it might. So we'll, but the way, like, but downloads probably won't make any difference anyway. As it turns out, like the you know the single went, it it, it's, it went in at like twenty one or something like that. So we we missed the top twenty because of yeah. downloads. But it's funny that people, uh, you know, even in two thousand five, were just like, oh, digital's probably not going to make that much difference. But it it really did, you know. And it was like, mm. it, it again, it shows how different the times are. But, um, but. You know, just even just that, like that, that was just not what we expected when we were putting that that record out, and 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 the go- the goalposts had moved. Obviously, like it was like the. But I think the reason why the singles did well is because all those kids that we would met when we were going out and playing shows in their town, you be, you become their favorite band. It's like if if you if you're if you play a small town that doesn't get many shows. Or doesn't get any shows. All those people in that town, they they end up loving your band because you came there. Yeah. We knew that because we knew from experiencing Wakefield that you know 
Um, but one time in 1994, therapy had played Wakefield. So, and even like years later, everyone in Wakefield like loved therapy. And it was like, because they came there, you know? And so yeah, we had this yeah. thing where we wanted to get to all the little towns and we did that. And, and that's why, you know, that single did well. It's like the, those kids just felt connected to you and went out and bought it for that reason. It wasn't because they heard it on Radio 1. It wasn't because, you know, we had those sort of, uh, advantages that a lot of our, a, a lot of those bands signed to major labels had. We just, we just had the kids behind it, and, and you guys had the same thing as well. You know, I remember like you guys would put singles out, and like it, they, were, they were all like they were all top forty, I think. You know, and it's like, yeah. Uh, um, when Panic Attack came out, a similar thing happened where we uh, we just got. Um, I went to twenty one as well, so we we missed out on that. Yeah. It, it is top twenty, isn't it? Top of the pops. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah, so yeah, we we just missed out there as well. Well, that was but that was that era though. You know, it's like the the, the labels were so the the labels were playing catch up with the bands, and the, uh, because the bands were connected to the kids, and the labels were still kind of a bit old school, and they didn't know what the kids were doing, and so that you could pretty much get away with doing whatever you wanted because they didn't they didn't realize that. Well, not 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 witches have so much, but I'm saying like as far as like big labels, it was like they didn't, they, you know, they didn't have to do anything. They didn't have, they didn't really have to do much, and like because no. the bands were so connected to the fans, and it was the first time that that had happened. And yeah. and the, you they, know, they the, just put the money in, and then yeah, the the labels didn't really have to like do any of the work, and and and. and the irony was that the bands that they were spending loads of money on and, and signing and grooming, the kids didn't weren't into it because they could see through it. They could see that it was like a, you know, it wasn't an organic thing. They could see that they had like a lot of investment and, and it didn't resonate with people in the same way. It was a it was a weird time and it's like very much. I'm sure it's very much like what happened when when punk was kicking off, you know, and like like all these bands were just getting signed like straight away and you know they, they had the advantage because they didn't really care about the the industry so much I, I i do remember that as well i remember like i've sort of changed over the years now but like you know back in those days i was really suspicious like really just like just held everyone at, ha- at arm's length you know and um I think that's part of why things were exciting. It was like it 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 had gone it had gone mainstream nationally. Had you know the scene had or whatever, but no one really wanted that much to do with it. You know what I mean? It was like, it's, it's, it was crazy how much contempt like the bands kind of had for the for the. Um, for the establishment of the of the of the industry and of and, and of the like, I, I think for us it's because we didn't really get play like we didn't like we didn't really have much radio support in the early days. We didn't really have much uh, media coverage. But when so when you start doing well without it, you start being like, well, I just you know that's that's preferable. I'd rather I'd rather keep myself to myself. Now we've had guests on who said there was a bit of an ethos at the time of bands helping each other out. Is that something you felt at the time? I mean, the, I, I would say for the most part, yeah, definitely. I think, um, you know, the, there was a lot of like-minded people who uh, they wanted to see their friends do well, you know, and 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 that that possibility was there. It's like it, it, there, was no, there was no reason not to, you know what I mean? But... But there was still some people who were very competitive, some, you know, which is not to, to us that was like antithetical to our belief system. Like we were, we were from a, a DIY background, so we wanted we wanted to help other people do well. But there were some people who still had that like typical kind of you know competitive streak, and 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 and, and they sort of tended to be more careerist as bands did those people anyway. So. I think that the people, who, I think that the bands who did well were the ones who were more community based, as opposed to being, um, you know, competitive. It just, it just didn't really, that didn't really fit in our worldview. Um, 
and it, and it, 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 it made things easier because you got to go on tour with bands that you loved and you got to see bands that you really liked every night. And it, that, that helps every, I think that helps everyone do better. You know, it's like, if, if you really like, I, if I think back to the new fellas tour, it's one of the best times of my life really, because I was with every night we, we, we used to put, we used to take two bands as support every, every tour. So every night was a three band bill. And those two bands we would take, they would be like our favorite bands, our favorite people. And you'd all be together and you'd, you get to party every night and see a new city every night together, you know, and that, that, that's way more exciting than just, you know, trying to, trying to tick every box and be a, be a, a big, a big star in your own right. And just forgetting about everything else. So it was that, it, it was that sense of having, having everyone with you. That was, that was really, that, that was more gratifying than, than anything else. And I remember like, taking when you take bands on tour you love like I remember we took Jeffrey Lewis on tour a lot and I remember one of my one of my happiest memories is like Jeff Lewis opening up for us at Leeds University Refectory which is a massive place we'd always wanted to play but just watching Jeff play he's just a guy on his own with an acoustic playing to like you know 3,000 people or whatever the capacity is there and like and just having a really good gig to me that was like that was an amazing moment, and because you was like, "Oh, these all these people are hearing this because because we brought him on tour, and that we got as much satisfaction out of that as as what we did out of our own show in some ways." So it it, it made everything feel feel better, and I felt like you you know you you sort of could have an impact on what people listen to. Like you know, it, it wasn't. It wasn't just down to magazines to tell people who the who the good bands were. It was like the bands would bring people along, and and that's how that's how kids were finding out about people at that point. And that that was empowering, you know. It's an empowering feeling. It's really great. Yeah, definitely. Um, like like you said, it was just like it's like it was like a it was like a family, wasn't it? Really, when when you're on tour, you got you have got a, you got. Just to go out with all the people that you love, like it obviously made yeah. it easier. As obviously, you 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 tour and you are actually a family, but you know, like <laughs> everybody else, <laughs> everyone else that you choose to take, and you're like, you know, it, it has to be right. And like all the bands, like the community vibe of that made all the difference, didn't it? Uh, yeah, it did. And like I was saying, it, it was empowering because it felt like it felt like you had control in a lot of ways like you had you had sort of control over like you know what what music people were getting exposed to it's like you you were, when you when you when you're helping drag other people up as well it's like you know you feel like you're sort of creating something bigger than just like oh we're just a you know just a band on tour like i, I you know I, I don't want that to sound too hyperbolic but it's just you know it, it felt like culturally you were like able to like assist other other if you if you could assist other bands it was culturally more valid than just like you know doing it for your own ends really and mm. and and plus it was just fun it was just, yeah it was just nice to have them people around bands that you really like listening to people that you really like hanging out with and like everyone was like really gracious to each other because you know bands would appreciate you taking them on tour and we used to appreciate people taking us on tour as well so it was a bit of a it could be a bit of a you know uh it, just a mutual sort of respect thing yeah and it was like the the more the more we kept it that way and we had a control over it i guess like it lasted longer as well and we obviously didn't ever want it to like end so it was like you know yeah. creating creating a bigger thing made it, it did, made it last it didn't and that's why, I mean, later, later on, we sort of got a reputation as being sort of, uh, you know, a little bit kind of pessimistic and like an outsiders because I think what happens, like when we, when when you see, it get, it, it's, it's great at the start, it's exciting at the start, and then you have that peak where like, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of good bands around and like all this stuff's happening and then, and then you get that, that period where it, it becomes totally oversubscribed and you, you can see that it's dying at that point. And I think by 2007, 
which is when our third album came out, um, which was our biggest album. But like by that point, it was, everything was really mainstream. Like very, mm. like you know, it was everywhere. It was like bands songs were on like tv adverts and on like tv shows like you know and uh all of people were all over the radio and like and it was typically like it was typically bands who were you know kind of like the major label versions of the bands who came before like it was that sort of like watered down sterilized version and um by that point we just didn't really want associating with it and we were just like really trying to like distance ourselves from that you know that corporate indie scene really is what it was like, yeah. you know yeah it, it, and and that's why we got that reputation for being like a little bit uh you know like i said like kind of curmudgeonly or, or pessimistic because we were just like look we do, we, we, we've already we've been a, we've been around since 2002 and we've, we've done two albums already and we didn't want our third record to be judged because of the climate at the time which was just like yeah you know uh, way, way more, way, way more corporate and, and just yeah, there's, a, diff- there's... a different reality. Mm. I think the reason why it was 2007 was because you'd seen that organic sort of uh, build up and then the Arctic Monkeys put out their record 2006, which was just a phenomenon, like just like absolutely massive, like game changer for the, for the, for the whole country. They were sort of the first band to like have huge success based on uh, a, an online fan base, like, and, and, and the fact that kids were connected and really felt a connection to those guys because of their, you know, relatability, and, and they and they were sort of singing about the things that all those kids were living, you know, and and so when, once that had gone like absolutely stratospheric, that's when the major labels were just desperate to find like a, again, like they, they, they were scouring like internet message boards, like. They, they, they'd start the, the, the labels had sort of wise they'll turn those scouring internet message boards and like any any sort of they were just desperate to find the new Arctic Monkeys and, and a lot of bands got signed who like definitely just jumped on that bandwagon and just didn't do you know just didn't do as good of a job of it obviously and um, but they were getting the big push you know like a band a band would get signed because they had a regional accent or because they had a you know, an on, a big online fan base would get signed and just be like, you know, millions of pounds put behind them. And it was just, you know, ultimately it was just not, it was just a watered down version of it all. And, and that's when things just started to collapse as far as, like, as far as like that, as far as like that, that initial excitement, like I, I, we weren't excited by it at all. And we just started to really, really try and separate ourselves from it as much as we could. I saw a quote in Q magazine that said you're the biggest cult band in the UK. Is that a tag you guys are happy with or something that you don't give much thought to, really? I mean, at the time, it was like, you know, it was funny because, like, those those magazines, the, the, those, those kind of monthlies and those kind of, like, like older magazines were, were much slower to come around to us than, than anywhere else. And so it was it was kind of vindication, I suppose. It... it I mean, obviously, if I'd have ever had any choice in the matter, I, I would have, I would have always. That's what I would have aspired to, you know. I would have aspired to have been a big cult band. That, that, that to me, like, takes a lot of the pressure off having to be, you know. Um, if you're a cult band, you don't have as much pressure as if you're just trying to be the biggest band, you know. Because like, we watched a lot of bands get really big and then come down really quickly as well. Because it was like, you know, they rode that way. If it was like. It, that wasn't ever really our thing. Like we just wanted to be doing what we were doing, and like hopefully, the more people get exposed to it, the more people like you and 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 understand you. But we didn't really want to be. We didn't. We just didn't really want to be like, you know, uh, like that zeitgeist thing. Where you just have to be. You just have to be what's right for that moment because it just dates. It just dates so badly. Like, so yeah. That if I'd have been given a choice, that's what I would have wanted, and that, you know. Um, I think that it's more to do with the fact that you've, you've sort we, we'd sort of got big without that without that sort of conventional support. So therefore, you get you know you get labelled as a cult band. And, and and to be honest, like it's it's a privilege because you can you know it means you can just do things on like we've never changed how we operate. Like even now, like you know, 
18 years into it or whatever it is like we, we we haven't changed how we operate at all it's still exactly the same it still feels exactly the same and and to say that we went through the mid 2000s where you know that was absolutely the dominant force in like british pop music to, to say that we still operated in during that period how we operate now and how we operate when we first started i'm, I'm proud of that fact and looking at things now i mean we had ross from the future heads on a couple of weeks ago and he described music at the moment as extremely bland um is that how you see it how do you see guitar bands nowadays i mean mainstream music's always pretty bland i mean that's just the that's just the the way that it is because it's it's palatable and 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 people you know people like things that are palatable and that's that's usually the way that if if something's like popular across the board it usually means it's pretty you know it, it's pretty uh uh easily digestible so I, I've I've never had a I've never had a problem with that. Like some pop music, I really like some some I don't. Modern pop music, um, I don't really pay a great deal of attention to. Um, but as far as guitar bands, I mean, it's hard to talk about. I mean, it it depends. Like I mean, because it always goes in in peaks and troughs. I mean, it's definitely in a trough right now. But but the but the peaks are usually kind of pretty. Like if you look at the late nineties, like or like the whatever the, when over the Brit pop, the height of Brit pop was. I mean, it was popular, but there was probably not that many great records getting made. And it was the same thing with our era. Like it, when when it was at its peak, you know, most of the most of the best records of that era had already been out a few years before that. So it's like usually the the commercial peak is not the artistic peak is, is i guess what i'm saying but mm. right now i you know it, it's mm. hard it's hard to say like i guitar bands like i think i think the 90s um that sort of 90s resurgence thing was like fun for a while but like it, it became really played out really quickly and it was pretty pretty low stakes a lot of it to be honest like modern guitar bands i you know i there's still stuff going on. I, I I feel like it's probably a lot tougher for those bands because um, because of how burnt out everyone got on that that 2000s thing. Because it was just so oversaturated that like I mean it just doesn't seem that exciting. But I I went through a phase for a long time being like you know we we we've been unaffected by it. Like we we've been able to like still operate exactly as we always have done like i was saying that's that's been really cool but like um but as far as like modern stuff goes i i felt really alienated for a while i was like you know i, th- I think that there just isn't that community spirit anymore there isn't that like sort of uh that sort of recklessness or that sort of like you know just like you just live for it, you know, that, that, that whole thing of like, just like, that's your lifestyle and that's your entire reason for doing things. And, and I, I felt pretty uh, disillusioned by it. But then it was, it was fascinating. I was just over in the UK in February because like we had to go over to um, have some meetings and like sort out some uh, business stuff basically like with the band. And uh, I was flying back to Portland and I was just like, you know, watching the movies on the plane. I decided to watch the Little Peep documentary. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but I was like, it was is this surreal oh, no, moment. I've seen that. I quite, it's, I'd it's, like to watch that, actually. But yeah. Well, I, I didn't really know a great deal about him, but it, it was fascinating because I watched it and I was like, man, I spent all this time just thinking that, they, you know, that, that, the, that the kids don't have that sort of... Um, that, that community thing anymore. And I was like, watch, I was like, it made me feel really old because I was like, I couldn't believe that this, that, that, that whole scene had been that, um, that vibrant and that, that punk rock and that, you know, it's the real deal, you know, it's like people working together and networking with each other and like living together and, you know, just living and breathing it in that way that, you know, that, that I associate with and, uh, very very for real very creative very like uh very diy 
and I, I was really like inspired by it. I was like man these these people yeah. are these people are real deal you know and I was like, and I, it, but then it was bizarre to me because it, it happened and I had no idea about it and it made me feel like oh shit you know like yeah it's you, just, you just don't it's know what's what, going like, on anymore no it's I, I dipped into that a little bit like I've checked some of like that kind of scene out like I mean what do, what do we even call that music it's like rap like but kind of it's kind of like rock influenced as well yeah it's just like everything really you know and and that that was that was the thing i was i was really like i I was really inspired by like seeing that that spirit the the spirit that those guys all had and like and how you know and it was dangerous as well and it was like you know um it was that like reckless sort of like you know youth kind of lifestyle element to it which yeah you know, uh, which I haven't seen in I haven't seen that in uh, in sort of commercial music or like in in sort of mainstream music for a long time, and I, I thought like pretty much didn't exist anymore. You know, because mm. even when we go on tour like with young bands now, it's definitely a different reality because most of them have to have like day jobs, or most of them have to like um, you know the, the the sort of a little bit more um, worldly, just in general, from like you know growing up with the internet and like and, and the sort of a bit more like you know sort of self-aware and i, I miss mm-hmm. that sort of like that i miss that sort of recklessness of the of the first blaze of like you know the scene where like no one really cares what anyone else is doing you know like and then yeah. that, that, that's what was inspiring about seeing that it's like oh yeah like just doing their own you know they had their entire own world that like you know that they did it distributed it themselves on SoundCloud and and everyone else was caught up, you know. And it was just, it reminded me of like the same thing like with message boards. Like people found it organically and just loved it. You know, yeah. it was, the, the the parallel that I see with it is just like yeah, the community element and the fact that people are discovering it organically and it's getting big based on how you know, just based on people discovering it and liking it, like as opposed to it being necessarily through conventional channels but um but I, I don't know so much about the you know the the details I, I i i just i just i'm always inspired when i just see you know that community spirit and people's doing it themselves and like and it gets out there was now the difference is now like with everyone being online it's like you essentially become like a pseudo celebrity because you know people get to know your personality and you share everything with everyone. So it's, it's probably a much heightened version of it because, you know, you, you become a, you become a star, like whether it's mainstream or whether it's just to the people who like you. But I think the pressure that those people are under once they, once they get big, because they're just having to constantly feed, you know, and connect with people and they become like outsized personalities. I, I think that must be extremely difficult like extremely difficult mm. some people are cut out for it but most people aren't you know most people some people are cut out for like you know putting their personality out there on- online and-, and enjoying talking about themselves or enjoying like the attention whereas most musicians i know and most creative people i know find that to be a struggle so yeah definitely uh, yeah just the pressure now of like having to like communicate with people all the time it's like it means that ultimately it's kind of that live fast die young thing a little bit more because it's like you know you 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 can really turbocharge everything like by being in communication with everyone and by and by keeping people's interests like that but at some point it's going to burn you out because it's it's just hard to keep up with that you know i mean i could never I could never share that much of, of my own life, you know, like, mm. especially when I was, especially when the band was first starting out, like, but, but I totally respect it. People realizing that they can promote themselves and they can, and they can do things their own way and they don't need outside involvement. That's mm. just, it's just awesome. You know, it's like, that's, that's always been where the most exciting things happen. And it's always been the, the area that the, industry is usually unaware of at first and then it's and then that's why you have those great few years where it's like you know everything finally falls into place and then as soon as like as soon as the feeding frenzy starts it's pretty much already over you know because 
you know, it just gets watered down at that point. And it, it, it's always been like that. It's cyclical. It's been like that, you know, ever since the modern music industry started, really. But yeah, it, it was fascinating for me to see like another underground scene and just be like, and realize that I didn't even know that that had happened. You know, it's like, that was a real eye opener for me. Would you say that was one of the biggest challenges now for guitar bands, Gary, is that people aren't really that keen for it as they were back in the day? Yeah, I mean, I, if you're a, I think if you're a new guitar band, it, it's, you know, it's hard to compete with, with that kind of thing on, on a modern level because, like, because people, think, people want so much access to people. And I think that, you know, that's... I was saying some people cut out for that and some people are And I, I, I almost see the scene I was just talking about, that's kind of the new, that's the new punk rock, you know? Like, like old school punk rock is just, uh, you know, it, it, it's been around for so long. It's like, that's not exciting to kids now. What's exciting to young people now is just like the the fact that they have, every, they're so connected to everything. They have like all different, they're interested in all different styles of music and they don't really necessarily want the, they don't really want mag. They don't read magazines, but they don't really want magazines or like or the established uh, music industry telling them what to listen to. So they're just discovering stuff themselves. And it's like, you know, I think the idea of being a, a guitar band like like it was in the nineties or in the two thousands, like hitting it big because you know you have a you know a record label comes out of nowhere and picks you up and. And, and that's it like I mean that's the, that's really old school like that's like that doesn't exist anymore obviously my advice would, would always been that to do things as much as DIY as you can and do as much as what you can yourself but like that you know I think a lot of, a lot of bands like they still have that dream of like it's like hitting the lottery ticket where you just you know someone comes out of nowhere and signs you up and then you know you're going to be become a a, a big rich rock band it's like that that's just a that's just not the way stuff operates anymore and i think the the, the people who are doing all the you know the the are doing their own thing online and, and 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 connecting with people like that that's that's evolution that's just how people evolve but like for somebody like me if i was starting out now i would find that really difficult because i you know, I wouldn't want to share that much. And, and I, that's my fear of it is that like people who are better at self-promoting um, have the have the ultimate advantage and that like the, the sort of weirdo outsider uncomfortable kids who, you know, that they'll sort of maybe struggle to to be to be heard in future, you know, because like it used to be like it'd be like a you know, if you're a weirdo outsider artist, you might find like somebody at like a, a record label who really believes in what you're doing and takes a chance on it was like those people would never self-promote themselves or you know try to entertain people with their online presence all the time it's like those people will just work but they'll struggle to make a make a name for themselves but you know you see i guess like yeah it's just evolution the industry's changed so much since i've been in it like but, but like our our approach was always very hands on and very uh, autonomous and independent. So like luckily we didn't we didn't struggle with any of that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And do you think maybe some good bands are slipping through the cracks now because of that reason? Like they're not promoting themselves everywhere, or they don't have the confidence. Yeah, I think, I think it's possible for sure. Yeah, for sure. You know, like but you know, it's it, but it's trends as well. Yeah, like, yeah. Like I can't, I can't imagine that. I mean, it, things come around in in cycles. Like, but at the moment, it's like, yeah, I can I can see why there'll be more excitement about somebody um, like home recording and, and and splicing like punk rock and rap and you know like whatever various styles together, like. That's that is a lot more exciting than a conventional guitar band at this point in time, and I can see why. I do, I do think that like, and pop's just a different reality. Pop, like the pop world has always been just, you know, sort of middle ground anyway. So I never, I never really, I never really look at like 
the pop charts as far as like trying to gauge what the trends are it's usually just like it's usually what the teenagers are listening to it's what the trends are it's like and right now it's like yeah you wouldn't want to listen to i i think a conventional guitar band it's just definitely i mean maybe it'll come around again but it's it's a little bit it's a, it's not it's just not it's just not it's a bit too tr- traditional in some ways mm. like the idea of like a guitar band signing to like a major label and getting a big push i mean it does still happen it does still happen but it's you know it's it's usually pretty like shit di- to be honest <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was gonna say they're just a different they're a different kind of it is yeah. that happen. yeah more of like a pop they're, they're still quite poppy in my eyes some of you know some of the guitar bands yeah, are getting signed it, now still, it's, you know Weird. It, it, and it, and yeah, it's not, you're very, right. it's it's not very exciting. Yeah. Why can't 